So in this video, we're going to be talking about using an op amp to actually do something. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be talking about what is called the non-inverting amplifier. But before we can do that, we need to talk about how op amps are actually used in circuits. And in fact, there are two very important rules of op amps that we need to make sure we understand before we can move forward. The first rule is that V plus equals V minus. The reason this is true, or more accurately, the reason that this is a good assumption, is because in an ideal op amp, the gain is infinity. Now, we don't like dealing with infinities, so if the V plus and V minus were not the same, then in theory we'd be asking for an infinite voltage. There'd be a difference of really anything, and multiplying that by infinity would give us a theoretically infinite voltage. Instead, if this is assumption is true, then V into the op amp, which is V plus minus V minus, will always essentially be zero. This you may have heard as the virtual short circuit. And let's see why we might call it that. Here's an op amp, and we just assume there's some other stuff going on in this circuit. Okay, we're not going to draw that in, but we're assuming it's, it's different. Here's V plus and here's V minus. And if they're the same, it's as though they're connected inside the op amp virtually by a short circuit, or VSC. The second rule of an op amp, if you're looking at the virtual short circuit, you might say, well, why don't we just replace the op amp with a wire? This is the second rule, no current flows. So it's as though it's behaving simultaneously as a short circuit in terms of voltage, but an open circuit in terms of current. So the internal circuitry of the op amp makes this approximately true. Not really. But for the most part, V plus might be V minus within a couple of millivolts. And no current might flow through, but maybe you might get a nano amp or something like that. For approximations and for a lot of circuit design, these two rules are key. Let's put these two rules together to create something called the inverting amplifier. One important thing to understand when dealing with op amp circuits is that there are several that have been discovered that are very, very useful. We tend to study them on their own because once you can see them and how to use them, then you can just look at an op amp circuit and say, oh, well that's an inverting amplifier, or perhaps that's a non-inverting amplifier. And then rather than redoing the entire circuit analysis, you can just use these well-developed techniques on the well-developed circuits. The inverting amplifier is the one we typically start with because it requires the fewest assumptions and is, in a sense, the simplest to come up with an equation for. Let's draw it first. So this is V in, and this is usually how we're going to see the op amp drawn. I'll draw in the rest of the wires in a moment. We call this R1 and R2. You might also see this one referred to as RF for R feedback. The feedback means that it's as though we have a current going back and into our op amp. We'll take a look at what that looks like when we actually start analyzing it. Now, what might confuse you a little bit is if this is V out, it's as though it's only a single wire, similarly with V in. Implicitly, there are some connections here that we're not putting in. The reason I'm leaving them out is because you'll see them, the op amp circuit drawn a lot like this. But what do we really mean here? Let me draw it more as a circuit, something we're more familiar with. There would be a voltage source connected to ground, and then V out would also be connected to ground like that. And typically, 
we'd have some load resistance, RL. So in this sense, when you take a look at it, now we do have a circuit. There are things connecting back to our ground, there are loops, and everything else that we're familiar with. Now, remember, no matter what we're doing in the op amp, we'd like to have an expression that says V out is equal to something times V in, if possible. We'll see in a couple of videos that we're going to have to modify this general equation a little bit. But for the most part, we're always looking for the expression of V out equals to something multiplied by V in. Now the question is, how do we begin to analyze the circuit? Starting on a fresh page, I'm going to redraw the circuit as you'll usually see it. This is normally how you're going to see it, without all the extra connections in. Please get familiar with this, because it's a almost industry standard. So what can I do? Well, I still have my familiar circuit analysis techniques. I have Ohm's Law. I have KCL. I do have KVL, but in this particular case, I'd rather we don't use KVL for op amps, mainly because when it's drawn like this, it's not very obvious where the loops are. I have other techniques as well, but for the most part today, we're only going to need these two. Let's start drawing in our currents. I1, I2, and I'm going to draw in another current here, which we'll call I3. Now, step one was to label our currents. Step two is to apply the rules. What we're doing essentially is reducing the number of variables. The rules say the following. I3 has to be equal to zero. I3 would be current going into the op amp, but from rule two, no current enters the op amp, so I3 must be zero. Similarly, V plus has to equal to V minus. And we know that V minus is zero volts because it's connected to our reference. Therefore, these are all zero volts. I can now use KCL. Step three is apply the laws and solve. Now, it might not seem obvious what I'm about to do, but I'm going to use KCL, and the reason I'm going to do that is because I know it's going to give me an expression involving V out. But bear with me, and let's see what happens. So, KCL requires me to express my currents in terms of the voltages. Well, I1 is equal to V in minus V plus, but remember this is zero, divided by R1. I2 is V plus minus V out, and that's where that V out is coming from, over R2, and again, V plus is zero. And from KCL, I1 equals to I2, because I3 was zero. So this leads me to two expressions. V in over R1 is negative V out over R2. Our next step is to solve for V out. It turns out what we're going to get is V out is negative R2 over R1 V in. And remember, our goal was to get V out something times V in. So I'll say that my gain, A, is negative R2 over R1. Now, why is it called an inverting amplifier? Because of that negative. If V in is positive, V out will be negative. If V in is negative, V out will be positive. The sign is inverted. Why is it called an amplifier? Because it has a gain dependent on these resistors. In a little bit of an awkward use of terms, if R2 is less than R1, we actually get a gain less than 1. So we don't amplify, we attenuate. However, we still use the general term amplifier. So, although we studied a particular op-amp circuit, 
we've developed some very important general rules. Step one. Look at your circuit and label. In my case, I labeled currents. For the most part, we're going to be able to use KCL for many of our op-amp circuits. Number two, apply the rules. That's virtual short circuit and no current. Number three, once you've applied the rules, you can ignore the op-amp. The rest is a circuit design problem that we've been working with before. Remember, we're trying to solve for V-out. Number four, get the equation in terms of V-out is something times V-in. And this four-step process is going to lead us through the vast majority of op-amp circuits we'll be looking at.